So the headline feature for Season 8 is players being able to join the battle for the Sea of Thieves. So we have two factions, the Guardians of Fortune and the Servants of the Flame. Players can pledge their allegiance to one of these two factions and then do ship combat on demand against the rival faction. In the Sea of Thieves sandbox today, players can join a crew, they can sail the open seas, and eventually they might find another ship on the horizon. And then when they go to engage in ship combat with that crew, they might not be up for it. With Season 8, we wanted to add a predictable way for players to get ship combat on demand against another crew that are up for the fight. We know how exciting ship versus ship combat is in our game. We understand that it's kind of a unique part of our game that players don't get to experience elsewhere. It felt like a perfect opportunity for Season 8 to bring that to players on demand and create those magical moments for players whenever they choose to have that experience. We have two factions that players can pledge their allegiance to. The first is the Guardians of Fortune, and the second faction we have is the Servants of the Flame. The Guardians of Fortune aligned with the Pirate Lord and include Belle and Merrick and all the characters that are seen as the, the positive side of the pirate's life. The counterfaction to that is the Servants of the Flame, who is headed up, of course, by Captain Flameheart. So when Season 8 launches, players will be able to board their ship and in the captain's cabin of their ship, there'll be this new object. It's called the Hourglass of Fate. As a crew, you can go up to that, rotate it to represent the faction of your choice. You vote on this hourglass to represent that faction, which opts you in to the battle for the Sea of Thieves. We didn't want to change the way Sea of Thieves plays for players that don't want to partake in PvP combat. This is purely an opt-in mechanic to join the battle and for players to have ship combat on demand. When you've joined the fight, you've got two options in how you want to progress for the factions. So the first and main way is the ship combat on demand, and that will spawn you into a ship combat combat against that rival crew, sinking them will earn you allegiance, which is how you progress with our new factions, how you level up with our new factions and earn the new cosmetics and rewards. The second core way that players can play Season 8 is they can join a faction and then they can amass faction treasure on their ship. And this means that when a rival faction does hunt them, if they defend their ship with honour and sink them, they will earn more allegiance for defending their ship because of all the faction treasure they protected. Hunting another crew is one of the most spectacular moments that we've ever added to Sea of Thieves. You unfurl the war map, throw the daggers in, and you vote to dive. And as soon as you are in open water, the bow of your ship will dive beneath the waves. You'll get the rush of water past you. And from that point, you're then gliding through channels beneath the waves in the hunt for your rival faction crew. It was really interesting exploring that bottom of the ocean because we've scraped the surface of it with the shrines in the past. We'd like to imagine what is that sort of dead space in between these, you know, places of actual playable space. So we've got parts that are very coral laden, some are rocky. We've also got some ancient civilization architecture and big battlefields full of wrecks. I kind of went with a like very inner kind of treatment there and I've used like some rain sounds you know you've got the, the sound of the rain when you're under like a tree or under a roof so I just like low pass that which means like I would cut all the high frequency of that just to keep like the little grainy crispy like <laughs> that kind of almost soothing limbo-esque uh, kind of sonics it's a little bit different from what we're normally doing in Sea your crew gets put into a, a matchmaking queue. Um, there's separate queues for factions and the different ship sizes. Um, and then sloops are, are divided into two as well, so you get a two player sloop versus single player sloops. It's a bit of an unfair match. Every crew is assigned a skill rating, and we then look for the closest matches in terms of skill. After every match, we record whether it was a win or a loss and the relative skill difference between the two different crews and that will determine a, a new skill rating. A straight kill to death ratio doesn't actually mean you're winning fights, right? A player that's really good on cannons at sinking of a ship's or really good on the wheel or something isn't going to get those player kills. So at the moment, yeah, it's purely done on wins and losses in those battles um, that affects your skill rating over time. And your crew skill is then the average of all your, all your players' skills, and that's, that's what we use to match them. And then once we found you an opponent, your ship bursts out of the waves and you can see the other ship in front of you. It's just the best moment. It's your 
underwater and your ship is accelerating and you can just feel that power and you can you have your ship like going just in the air like and crashing back on the waves you just feel like a god at that point it just feels so right my favorite piece of music that i've written for season eight is the battle music just trying to make the player feel like oh, yeah, i've just rocked up i'm going to end this other ship or like the ship itself if you're just sailing along the sea doing your own thing and then suddenly someone rocks up next to you and you're like oh crap this kill or be killed. If players do try to flee the combat area, the hourglass of fate starts to become unstable and it starts to kind of crack and split. Essentially everything's tied to the hourglass and you can tell something's going horribly wrong like if you keep going into that direction. You go a sound for when you're reaching the inner bound that tells you like, you shouldn't go further. And eventually if you go too far, the hourglass of fate will blow up and your ship will automatically sink and it will award the other crew a win and you a loss. That was a really important point for us. We want to have a clear winner and a clear loser of combat and then to separate the two crews after the combat is drawn to a conclusion. The losing crew will actually move to a new server and get migrated away from the winning team. Every time you sink a ship in season eight, you will get a bump of allegiance towards your faction. That's immediately granted. But we also wanted to kind of add this risk-reward loop into continuing to push for higher streaks and continue to push for further reward. So as you sink ships, value will be added to the hourglass of fate that is aboard your ship. And you'll be able to go over to the hourglass and look at the card above it. You'll be able to see exactly what you're on. And that will be earned for the number of ships you sunk. And also you will get more the higher the streak you are on. But the crucial thing about the hourglass of fate and the value that's stored inside it is you don't actually earn that until you sail back to an outpost to leave the fight. And so we really encourage us players to run the gauntlet, sink as many back-to-back -back ships as they can, because the more back-to-back -back ships they sink, the greater the rewards will be. Once a ship or a crew has got enough kills in a row and they get to a four streak for their faction, they become a champion for their faction. And that then allows a new option to appear on the war map. This new option allows them to face off against bigger ships than their own. For other players on the server who are members of the rival faction, your location essentially gets broadcast. So if they sink you, or if you as a player sink another rival faction ship that's also a champion, you'll get extra reward, you'll get extra allegiance, there'll be extra gold in the form of Sands of Fate when you leave the faction, extra reputation rewards as well for those players that are playing Emissary play as well. We've got these brand new figurehead effects on the ship and as the player streak increases, these effects essentially wrap the ship and once you reach faction champion, that's when they're at their brightest. So everyone who's looking over the horizon with a spyglass will be able to see you. You know, you're on a, a very high streak and you know, you're not to be trifled with. When a player joins a faction and they join the battle for the Sea of Thieves, they don't have to go and hunt other rival faction crews. They can go and enjoy Sea of Thieves as they always have done, doing world events, doing quests, and amassing faction treasure aboard their ship. As a result of them being in the fight, other rival factions can actually invade them at any point and they can defend their ship with honor. So the more faction treasure a crew amasses, the more allegiance they will earn for successfully defending their ship. Earning allegiance will grow your level within those factions. Players can choose to level up purely in the Guardians of Fortune or purely in the Servants of Flame, or you can do a bit of both and get rewards from either faction. We're not locking you into one particular way of play. Once players have reached level 100 for the Guardians of Fortune and they're a pirate legend, they can get secret access to this extended area of the pirate legend hideout. And for players that have reached level 100 for the Servants of the Flame and are also Reaper level 75, they can go to the Reaper's hideout and get access to the Reaper's lair deep below the Reaper's hideout. When you reach level 100 in the Guardians of Fortune, you go down to the Pirate Legend hideout, as many players have done before, and speak to the Pirate Lord, and he will open a new door out of the back of the Athena's Fortune shipwreck that will show you into a new area of the Pirate Legend's hideout. There you'll be amongst other legendary pirates, drinking and taking part in tavern games. You'll meet new and returning NPCs. So one of the new ones is Samuel, he's a bard. His role with this faction is as their chronicler. And we're doing some really cool stuff with these chroniclers across both factions in that they will constantly update players on the progress 
um, in the fight for the Sea of Thieves. We're tracking the win percentages across both factions and we'll be representing that to players through the chroniclers in each of the hideouts. And then you can make your way to the back of the Pirate Legend hideout where Bell and Merrick and even the Pirate Lord himself are waiting to grant you the blessing of Athena's fortune. Taking part in the blessing of Athena's fortune, we'll see you kind of shake hands, be face to face with the Pirate Lord before receiving the blessed ghostly form. So it kind of creep up your arms and you'll unlock the ghost curse. And this will allow players to represent themselves as a, as a true legend of Athena's fortune. So the blessing of Athena's fortune is something that Robin wrote and it just makes you feel like this sense of camaraderie where you're singing all together with all of the pirates. The pirate lord, you hear Belle singing. Belle has a lovely voice, turns out. And so does Merrick, so does the pirate lord. So yeah, you just have a great time. <laughs> The Reaper's Lair is hidden below the Reaper's hideout. You'll descend in a lift into the belly of the island and explore a fiery, rich environment filled with new NPCs and characters that are all dedicated to Flameheart and in service of his goal to see the Sea of Thieves be taken over by his vision of the pirate's life. Even before you see the first glimpse of this area it's about the journey down into it and you have the sort of story going on around you and then as soon as you breach down into that area you, this world just sort of opens up into this cavern with lava it's such an epic feeling that we wanted to like lead with the sense of power and the sense of like hidden power as well players have no idea what's been lurking off down here and it's almost like you get a sense of like they're an army that's preparing for something. We wanted to have a kind of tavern area, but we didn't want it to be just mirroring stuff that's above ground, like what would a Reaper's tavern look like? I thought the idea of like a grand hall and this kind of cultish secret club would be quite cool to see. And they're, they're all sitting around toasting to Flameheart. It's really like lending itself to that role play that we wanted to, to push in this environment as well. We found it really important to make it so players don't get lost, to ease any frustrations. They are presented with a sight line of every location that's in, of importance. So from that entrance, they can see the Bonesmith, they can see the Chronicler, the Tavern. It's all very obvious and clear, and with joins between them, rather than just straight routes. I feel for, for characters, you have to find the few quirks that really brings it to life. For the skeletons, it's even uh, more important because they don't have all those very familiar facial expressions we rely on to decide if this person is maybe friendly or not, without even skin or, you know, eyeballs. How do you find that thing that makes them feel alive? For the Reapers Chronicler, you have someone that embodies a bit of the darker side. So we have almost this historian that's hunched over the desk and they're writing down what's going on. and. Whether or not it's truthful or not, we, we sort of maybe wanted to hint towards maybe, you know, this idea that historians might spin the, the truth in their favour. The interesting bit about the Reaper's Lair is that it's mostly, well, it's mostly the audio team like doing it. So we've got uh, John and Jamie, which are doing the Chronicler, which is pretty cool. It's got two heads. It's two different people. So they got their own personality, their different accent, and it's, it's really cool. It gives a lot of, it's bring back a lot of tone to those characters. And Katie's doing the, the bartender, Shadrach's doing the bonesmiths, again, with a completely uh, different vibe, and, and I'm doing the, the emissary. At the deepest point of the Reaper's Lair, you will emerge into this chasm that is taken up by the Tree of Rebirth, surrounded by the sap of that tree, and greeted by the voice of the flame, who's a new NPC, whose sole purpose is to transform you into the ultimate vision of Flameheart's version of the pirate's life. Taking part in the Ritual of the Flame will see players drink from the cursed chalice and transform into a skeleton. We'd look through old Reaper work, previous cosmetics that we've provided for the Reapers. There were these weapons that we did that had this like gnarled wood motif. You're becoming a skeleton. It's almost like this like rebirth. So we, we kind of things slotted together and we thought, okay, it's like a tree of rebirth almost. And there's something quite sinister and, and weird and unreal about, you know, a tree being underground. It was almost like a purposeful disconnect. How is this an evil place <laughs> with this bright golden glow? It looks inviting. And I think that's the beauty in a lot of uh, quote unquote evil factions is you can see the allure there. You can understand why someone might be tempted to that side. 
so it's not you know dark and evil and spooky it's quite attractive sort of place these cutscenes are you know the biggest that we've done in sea of thieves so we really have to do a lot of work and planning we typically do something called previs or previsualization where we kind of use this tool to kind of choreograph the scenes and figure out the timings and, and what where the characters are going to be what they're going to say and it's for identifying the story beats of, of the cutscene itself once we've done our, our previs um, we go to motion capture. Abby is our kind of our main motion capture actress for all of the characters that you actually see in games. Having uh, acted for Belle and a few of the other female characters, it can be quite tricky as an actor. You have a vision in your head of what you want. As an animator as well, you can get into your head a little bit too much and you kind of have to clear your mind a little bit and let the performance flow naturally because you do get a much better performance that way. It doesn't feel as forced. Once we've got our motion capture data, we then take that into Maya and clean up the animation that we've got, push poses to kind of really sell that performance. And then once we've got our final animation, we put it into game. For the skeleton transform, we really wanted to achieve this feeling of sort of your skin really burning away and this power inside you from the sap from the tree of rebirth, that it's like burning your insides away. I've got like ramping up heartbeat that's coming there and it's accelerating up to the point where, well, that's it, your skeleton, so there's no but there's no life anymore, it stops there. So I've got those elements and some more abstract elements to kind of give that sensation of power as, you, as you're being transformed. The really cool thing about the skeleton curse is we're allowing players to customize elements of the curse. So when players visit the bonesmith in the Reaper's Lair, they can change and customize their head, their torso, their legs, and even their bone color as well. So as players, continue to play and they unlock more and more skeleton cosmetics. We're going to see all this really interesting variety for these skeleton crews that are set and sail in the Sea of Thieves. I think what I'm most excited to see is just how far players can build their streak. There's going to be that natural sense of competition between players. I think it's going to be really exciting to see what records players can set. It will be good to see are they going to be good or bad and it will be just Great to see their reactions as well to the Athena's blessing and the ritual. Two ships fighting against each other with two crews who have very little idea what's going on is one of the most exciting experiences and I can't wait for players to, to get more of that. I'm also really excited for how this will improve the lives of players who perhaps don't want to engage in PvP combat because it pulls all of the players who want to PvP into a pool by themselves. It's such a cool addition to the Sea of Thieves sandbox and I think it will change the way that I approach my sessions in Sea of Thieves, whether I'm doing kind of world events or doing other activities. I've now got this option to get into like a, a high octane combat scenario with them. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked what you just saw and want to stay up to date with all the latest Sea of Thieves news, then hit subscribe and click that little ship's bell for all those notifications. Cheers.